Plot, Antoine, 2008. Written by Bari, Laura. A sensitive depiction of the real and imaginary worlds of a little six-year-old boy, who is lucid, confident and blind. Voice over off. When you're blind and watching movies, what will you find? A blind superhero whose superpowers are acting like he's not blind. A sighted actor over dramatically touching people's faces. Or maybe the whole joke is that they're bumping in to different places. A spectacular, macular. Welcome to Citizen White Cane, the podcast that has spent a year and a half looking for good blind representation using our detective skills and a bit of childlike whimsy. My name is Sky McLeod. <laughs> I'm Melissa Buckta. And today we are talking about Antoine, the 2008 uh, documentary film uh, from uh, French Canada. Uh, from, Franco? French, from French Canada. Yes. No. <laughs> what is it? What is it called? Uh, there's a there's a war technical term. French Canadian. <laughs> Frank Franco, can, I don't. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Lord. Montreal. I think are they in Montreal? They're in I, Quebec, I imagine. Somewhere. I thought it was Quebec. Well, yeah, but, uh, but oh, Montreal, Montreal is in, in Quebec. Quebec. Yeah. Oh my God! Cool. I just <laughs> lost all of all of my Canada points with my friends in Canada. <laughs> well, I uh, I have family. My, I have a cousin who lives in uh, Montreal in Quebec. Ah. So uh, we did Christmas with them one time. Oh, um, lovely! Yeah, it's very very pretty, well, snowy. Quebec was actually one of the uh, trivia answers last week oh. that I got right. So nice. I, was, I was very proud of myself. So there you go. Yeah. So we know we're experts on all <laughs> French Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Sky and Melissa do not claim to be experts on all the culture, all <laughs> yeah. French Canadian culture. Please don't get, please don't add us. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, yeah. But, but yeah. This, this wonderful, amazing, imaginative uh, documentary. I really like. I actually really liked the uh, IMDb st- description because it said sensitive portrayal, and I thought it was. It was sensitive without being super intrusive. There's no. There's not really a narrator. Uh, and there's not very many talking head moments in this documentary. It there's is just like none. there's none. Not, You're not right. until like the very end. The, they like it, they interview his classmates. Yes, about him. Yeah, at the very end. But <laughs> yeah. But um, throughout that, it's just kind of this pastiche of moments uh, put together from Antoine's life, and we meet his schoolmates, we meet his teachers, we meet his parents. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. It is definitely, I mean, yeah, it's interesting. It definitely blurs the lines of, like, sort of, it, for a documentary, I feel like I'm so used to right now so many of the, like, docu-series on Netflix or something where it's, like, very much, like, documentary. This is, like, documenting an exact event that happened. We're going to get a bunch of interviews and we're going to get a bunch of, like, you know b-roll people showing things and like footage from the time you know like so they're like very overproduced and like Mm -hmm. just telling you a very specific story this is not like that at all no extremely like uh fluid yeah and like it's observational definitely it has Mm -hmm. like a what is that cinema verite i don't know yeah yeah i've been documentary class in a long time (laughs) (laughs) right no i'm I'm also thinking i back to my documentary class too um (laughs) Yeah, th- this movie, there are definitely bits and bops that are staged because we, or at least feel like they are staged to me because w- you are floating in and out of uh, Anton's imaginary world. He imagines himself as uh, Detective Anton or Detective Dak, the journalist, right. basically, who is on the hunt for um, Madame Rouchy. Uh, Madame Ruski. Ruski, thank Ruski. you. I knew I was going to say that wrong. Uh, <laughs> he's on the hunt for Madame Ruski. Yeah, it sounds very Russian. Uh, so a uh, Russian. I th- I was like, 
Rolski? Okay. <laughs> uh, yes. But he he and, and his friends are on the hunt for her throughout this entire movie so or documentary. So there are bits where he gets in the car and drives away. And Yes, it was so funny. My mom was like, <laughs> she had just listened to 23 Blasts and watched the movie. And she was like, I can't believe you guys didn't talk. You always talk about when you have a scene where a blind person drives and you forgot to talk about that with 23 Blasts. And I was like, it happens in so many it's, movies. I know. And actually... And then, but it, then I was like, well, actually, this week we're doing a documentary about a six-year-old. And guess what trope is in that movie? A six-year-old like, driving a car. Yeah. But she was like, a documentary about a six-year-old? So, you know. Yep. <laughs> I mean, for the record, uh, the the driving scene in 23 Blast is actually quite cute. Uh, I actually yeah. laughed. This is uh, like, this podcast is remembering all the driving scenes we yeah. forgot to talk about <laughs> from 23 Blast right. and other movies. <laughs> that, that one scene. Uh, yeah, so that kind of threw me off a little bit because my brain is settling in for a documentary and here are these things that are happening. And again, it isn't, there aren't markers or anything or barriers to say when you're in his head and when you're not. You yeah. just, after about 20 minutes, you can kind of judge out like the the flow and everything. Uh, and so you can figure, oh, okay, I'm we're in his head right now. And okay, we're in the real world. Right. But, but you kind of don't get it's almost weird at the end where they do interview his classmates because I feel like as it goes on you slightly get a sense of him as a kid. But a lot of it is so fantastical, it doesn't even like it's interesting, it doesn't really feel as much like a documentary in the way that it could just as easily be like the color of paradise or something. You know, like right, like it's right. it feels so much like because it's so focused on his imagination. Mm -hmm. And the whimsical, non, you know, realistic kind of <laughs> whims. It it has a very odd place of like exactly if it is documentary or more just kind of like the imaginings of a child, which I guess, I don't know, what is fiction I versus nonfiction? <laughs> right. Well, and when you're a child, it's harder for you to... to Get draw it. the line between right. what is real and what is that perspective of like yeah exactly like yes yeah yeah definitely like a six year old well, kind of I, I think that's what I really actually came to enjoy a lot about it I you know during all the school stuff I was really interested oh well what's you know what is the Canadian experience like for a blind kid you know for a blind person edu in education versus the American experience and that's absolutely not what the documentary no. is here to talk about and that's okay <laughs> I know I thought that too and then I was like okay well I guess we won't really find out in this documentary <laughs> no no <laughs> but but then I just really got absorbed in in just watching Anton and experiencing his sense of play because if you th if you think about you know, play is so important even yeah. for even for adults play is just an important thing to have in your entire life but, you know, how does someone with no vision experience play? How how do they what are what are the things that they do? What are the games that they're going to play? Right. And I realized that Antoine and I had a lot of similarities as to our means and styles of play. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. What what were some of the similarities? Uh, just everything with uh, with his like detective persona with the with the tape recorder. <laughs> Uh, and the microphone, I wasn't necessarily carrying around a tape recorder and a microphone, but I had a bunch of them. And my brother and I and my cousins uh, would spend hours making <laughs> uh, fake radio shows. Oh, and everything. that's so and, sweet. Yeah, and I know this is not exclusively blind. Like it's, I, there are plenty of people who who do this too. But uh, it's more blind accessible. I would always yeah. make films with my sister, and we would yeah. always do that. But yeah, <laughs> we uh, we made our fair share of like goofy movies and everything. But we loved, and maybe it was because of more of this is what I wanted to do. But we loved making news reports. Yeah, we would do movie news. We yeah. would do like on on the old like camcorder, yes. like like old cameras that had what what were those? Um, God. Uh, what are they like like the they're not vhs they're like the super 8. oh yeah not super 8. no but like beta not beta max no, but i know we we're, i know yeah, what you're talking yeah. about we had we had a little we started out with a big one that was like put on your shoulder and took actual giant tapes and then we graduated to like this little sony that my mom had yeah took the little tapes similar to yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, so we would we would we'd make movies. We would do we would record radio shows. We'd make like late night talk show type things. Uh, when we were camping, that was a lot of fun to do. Yeah, but I mean, and just um, 
Well, it's lots of imagination. It's interesting because his family is super not really in the document. Well, because he has like, does he have siblings? Because we see him with like friends that seem to be mm-hmm. classmates. And I don't think he has any siblings, but it's also because of the way it's presented. It's kind of hard to tell. Like he'll be hanging out with other kids and you, and it's like never totally clear if they're family members. Because it's so, the parents are very absent from the narrative. Mm-hmm. Like it doesn't seem like they're necessarily absent parents, but they're just like the, I feel like um, the documentarian, um, Laura Mm Burry was just not super, was just like, "Eh, let's not show that part of his life. (laughs) She's more interested in Antoine and solely in what Antoine is doing and interested in, I mean, I think Antoine, especially filming the imagination sequences, I think it looked like he was having a really good time. Yeah. And that's, you know, and that's important. And she wanted to, uh, she wanted to facilitate that and she wanted to show that. Yeah, it's really, I mean, it is definitely interesting I think, yeah, with disability, sometimes a lot of the narrative is like, oh, poor abled parents with their disabled children mm-hmm. and like what a burden and hardship on them. <laughs> and you know, is, and that this this is not, this is so not fall that. into that at he's all. He's six years old and he's doing things that I didn't get to do or experience until I was 13. Really? He goes everywhere and you know and maybe they let him wander around uh, alone let, it totally. seems like but it's never but, clear if there's like parents nearby right or if this was part of it. stage for the documentary right, or whatever. Right. but but you know he's he's wandering around experiencing the world he's hanging out with his friends he's you know obviously the driving in the airport stuff like the, and the stuff on the train like that's all staged but still he goes to Vietnam, which I assume is where his family's from. Yes. Yeah. yeah I, I don't do they I'm, say that in the movie? I think so. They don't. Yeah. I I'm, I can't remember if it's stated like his family is from Vietnam, but I'm pretty sure they're Vietnamese. At one point, he's like, I'm going to find Madame Bruski in Vietnam. Right, in Vietnam. And, and I'm like, like, well, okay, wait a, a minute. She's a Russian name. So. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's very cute, though. Um, yeah. it's. I feel like that also. I thought, I think that was sweet, too, of like being a kid and having, you know, visiting family abroad and mm-hmm. stuff with like kind of the fact that it was weaved into this narrative of the the person that he was searching for like you know that kind of I don't know it's, but I, his, I thought that was sweet yeah I mean his imagination his imaginary narrative is just is woven throughout his his life and his day to day things yeah. the story is added to and changed and um because Madame Bruski keeps becoming different things and keeps mm-hmm. like being in the water of like the raindrops or in uh, right. the, I don't know, the flowers or, or at least they speculate that she might be in mm-hmm. like all these different kinds of places mm-hmm. that are, you know, so it is very um, not, it's not grounded in like, you know, like, like it is not a narrative like you would have a... Like A to B to C. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's a very, yeah. it's a very just kind of like mood. It's kind of a vibe more than <laughs> it is um, like an actual like we're gonna find this person, which you know obviously would be very contrived if it was like that. It's much more mm-hmm. of just kind of like also like kids do get fixated on certain things, yeah. and and we'll just like kind of you know those things will continue they, to go. They yeah, play that they have to play it out to to um take it to its I can't say logical but like take it to its conclusion yeah. to experiment or to, just like just do it as much as you can until you get it until gets it gets boring. out of your system yeah yeah, yeah yeah exactly and I like that I mean I feel like you don't see that aspect of childhood especially the fact that it isn't like based on anything necessarily going on that it's just some you know mm-hmm. weird narrative that cut and that the other kids are kind of also you know in on this like right. idea well, they, they help him seems to have come from nowhere they help him make missing posters yeah and that they that they go hang up to find Which is very mademoiselle Oski. it's very it's all very cute um but yeah. Uh, yeah i like i like that that was that kind of thing of childhood is very um I don't know. You wouldn't. You don't expect to see that mm. as much in well, a we've, movie. <laughs> all of the documentaries we watch that have been about kids, or you know, younger people, have been about teenagers, mostly yeah. high schoolers, teenagers, young adults. So right. we've never really gotten to watch something that's a, about 
these the younger set these these really young kids right right and they're because they're like six years old so they're mm-hmm. like super young yep um but yeah i mean i think it was it was pretty sweet to see someone you know like a six-year-old blind boy who had such like confidence and like um just yeah just like a lot of just having a lot of fun too was very sweet yeah um i did yeah it was it's interesting it's one of those things where i was like okay this is like this is very much a vibe like at first i was like (laughs) because i was like okay it's a documentary about a kid and like we're watching you like we have watched a decent amount of documentaries about like Mm -hmm. teens and stuff so i'm like okay it might fall a lot of those those same things and then i was like no okay it (laughs) does not yep yep nope nope (laughs) take off your conventional documentary hat because this is not that i think i think a vibe is definitely something that describes it best yeah absolutely it's it's a freaking mood piece it really is much more than and it's i think at a certain point i had to be like okay i'm not i don't want to like put any sort of narrative thing on it because like i was saying yep. before like how like comparing it to the color of paradise which is like an actual truly a narrative of like mm-hmm. and even though that's not a documentary but like it does feel very real but it is still about like a family and it's centered around a blind boy young boy but it's right. like a lot more actual coherent narrative whereas right. this has none of the coherent no, narrative no. aspects yeah at all. i remember yeah i remember we were talking about that about color paradise and we and we kind of sort of compared it to it felt a little bit like a documentary. These like these right, people right. could be real. They're not like they're they're all actors, but, but these they feel they real. Feel so and the, real. And similar to this movie, the the camera is very much at the kids' level, you know. Yes. And that is very true of this movie as well. So like in in some very functional ways, it's similar. Mm-hmm. And we hear, you know, like we hear his perspective in the color of paradise. We hear all the recordings that Antoine has made in the movie, and so it's like you you have all these like kind of interspersed. We see him making the recording so we also hear him like narrating things and and putting the the uh, microphone near like other things to kind of listen in and that's part of the soundtrack so it's very much like the the sound world is very much from his perspective mm-hmm. similarly mm-hmm. um and that yeah and then it's all very much like the life of kids and you feel very much like you're being asked to be in their perspective so in those ways it's similar but when it comes to any sort of coherent plot or storyline there's nothing we don't no. really get that much we don't really know that much about him and it's in a context of family right or I, even we, the school or really that much yeah right i mean we could tell you a lot about antoine about antoine about who antoine thinks he is in his head and and what he experiences and how he perceives the world but as far as like concrete facts Nothing. I got nothing. Yeah. <laughs> nothing. I mean, he his family probably, at least he has some family in Vietnam. That's, I mean, yeah, we, we know that. that yep. is a personal thing. He mm-hmm. has some assistance with his, like, um, with blind, like, stuff. He, we see him using a brailler and, like, learning how to use, like, read braille mm-hmm. at times. Uh, what else? He, I mean, he has a cane, though. I, we don't see him, like, yeah, getting he, caught in mobility training right anything. he uses his cane but yeah we yeah. don't we never we never see that but he does seem to have some like resources of like blind education stuff yeah the there is one bit where he, he goes actually he's in we we called a resource when i was in school but he was in the spe, uh, special ed room and then he goes back to join the other kids right yeah so he's getting some kind of like one-on-one some kind of educational help right right which is i mean it's interesting yeah it's it's also like near the end we see him um kind of it's the his relationship with the other kids like yeah it's very play playful throughout most of the movie and then near the end he's kind of like you see some friction between him and the other kids right and i couldn't really suss out what was going on yeah. I didn't I didn't really understand because they him Antoine and Mele have a fight about something but I I couldn't figure out what the fight was I don't about. know yeah it's very it's it's super unclear and right. they like 
And and it's really hard to tell how much of it is like that six year olds are just, you know, will just be weird and mm-hmm. sometimes mad at each other, or if it's like actually because of his blindness. Or the game that they're playing and they just right. don't they don't agree on an aspect of the story. I mean, it's and it's substantial because he's with his teacher and he's sobbing. Yeah. There are, those are real tears. And she's trying so hard, you know, and what's the matter? What's the matter, Antoine? Do you want to talk to me? And he doesn't want to talk. And it's and then the whole thing is just kind of dropped and then the next scene, him and Melee are friends again. Right. But I, I think you're right about the whole, like, that's just being six. Like, you right. get angry because something doesn't go your way, and you say mean things, and then you apologize and you keep going. Right, right. And I think, but it was interesting because in that moment, I, you have a peek into, like, being a blind kid at any age is, like, it can be very frustrating oh, yeah. when you are expected to do like you basically do have to do more than the other kids and mm-hmm. like and there you get excluded from things and you know mm-hmm. kids are I mean I don't know maybe in in Quebec you get a better chance at like having good <laughs> disability well, education his, but probably not I mean it looked <laughs> it, a lot of it looked like it was things were being adapted for him I mean the science project with a giant flower I've done that. My my biology teacher, when we were dissecting worms, I got a giant worm Whoa. that I could take apart and feel and touch and, and see everything that was going on. Gosh, just I never like got his, that. Just, I'm going to college <laughs> again, and I'm like, oh, this okay. is the first time I'm actually getting a combination. So. <laughs> Request giant models of things. Yeah. <laughs> if I'm, I'm sure they have that. Yeah, I'm sure they've got a few floating around somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I think they have some of the The PSU so far seems like they have a really good... Uh, like DRC like Disability Research nice, Center nice. which is we'll see what it's like in practice but yeah I never got that kind of stuff I just <laughs> struggled through everything well, so <laughs> I I had an advantage especially in that class because my biology teacher shout out to Mrs. Davis anyway <laughs> it's awesome uh she her son Patrick is blind oh that's so sweet and yeah and he's down here in the states now uh, playing a band, I believe. Playing in a band is the last time. Well, last, it's last down in the heard. 48. What is it? What do you call in the, it? Well, if, I, if we were in Alaska, I'd say lower 48. Right, right. Um, you said you, he was down here in the States. Was he not I in did. Alaska? I did. Jesus. No, that's my Alaska talking. Okay. <laughs> no, he, because I he moved down here before I did. Um, he's in... I want to say Montana, but I'm pretty sure that's wrong. Some some place. He's in, he's in the country game. somewhere playing yeah. playing in a in a marching band and being awesome. Nice, that's yeah. cool. Uh, but, but yeah, she, she, it was it was really cool because she was one of the teachers I just didn't have to explain things to. Yeah, she just really nice. got it, and we just. And she just provided me with everything that I needed. She also snuck me audiobooks from the <gasps> teacher's lounge, which is pretty sweet. So. That's awesome, though. Shouldn't have had to sneak, though. <laughs> no, no. It w- no, honestly, everybody knew that we, that we were doing it, <laughs> okay. so it was fine. Uh, it was like some audio, it was like some sci-fi audiobook of the month club. Aww, but that's she's, sweet. she's actually the one who introduced me to Michael Crichton. Oh, so. that's cute. Yeah. But yeah, love it. Love her. Uh, yeah, so... That was really cool to see things like that. So I was like, oh, yeah, I got I got those same adaptations, too. Unfortunately, they didn't come until high school. But I, you know, I had them. His P.E. was adaptive. Oh, yeah. it, lo- or li- it looked like it could have been somewhat adaptive. I mean, he was playing with a goal ball, basically. OK, yeah. Well, there's one point where he's just like. Um, I, yeah, I'm trying to actually picture it. I don't really remember. I don't remember if the shots are maybe not close up enough. I think I was also like, this is subtitled because it's all in Oh, French. yeah, it's all. Yeah, and yeah. so <laughs> there's a lot of the visual stuff I did miss because it was very difficult mm-hmm. to read this movie. Like, I mean, you know, like many blind people, I think he talks pretty fast. So there were times where I was like not even having time to read things. Mm-hmm. And then it, because there's so much dialogue, it's like there was not a lot of time. And I like had a very busy day before we were gonna watch it so i wanted to watch it at night when my eyes were already hurting oh, from no. the day and so i was like oh god so i actually i stopped like and watched the last like only 20 yeah. minutes like yeah. the next day but because of that i missed so much of the visuals because it was uh, just like the subtitles were really no i hard. i when you said this was in um french canadian i was like well uh this is something i have to be a bright-eyed and bushy-tailed for Smart. so i watched it in the morning yeah but... i should have done that <laughs> no no yeah no it's 
I I was also going to watch it at night too, but I realized that I had had a whole day and I was like, hmm, reading this subtitle movie is not what I want to do. Yeah, it was hard. It was very hard. I wish I should have bought it on YouTube because I rented it on Apple TV. I did too. And yeah. YouTube has a feature where you can have it read the subtitles usually oh, depending okay. on how it's formatted. And so once I bought it on Apple TV and, and I was like, voiceover doesn't work. Mm-mm. And it's Apple. It's an Apple product. It makes me so I, mad. I, I don't get it. I truly, <laughs> like, I truly don't get it. Why does YouTube have their shit better than Apple when mm-hmm. it's like literally voiceovers made by Apple and they couldn't like make that work? Yet YouTube right. figured out how well, to make it work. Well, and even like all the Disney Plus stuff, the, all their subtitles are read to you. Oh, like do they have, uh, is it because they have audio description? Yeah. Or, okay, so it's not like you actually are having the voiceover read it to you it's, oh no no that's yeah, yeah. it's just audio description right yeah. right yeah it's hard because like you have to have the english audio description and then sometimes what they'll do is just like dub it mm-hmm. for audio description depending on i mean it's weird because it's like sometimes you have a movie where there's you know it's some a lot of it's in english but then some of it's you know in a bunch of different languages and mm-hmm. so then the audio description mm-hmm. will just read every time something subtitled right. Right. but then and sometimes some of them say the language but then when it's it's a little bit weirder if it's like everything's in french because then it's like do you dub it over or do you just have someone read the subtitles and then like you know is it silly to just have someone read all the subtitles but blind people also don't care about if the mouth moves in the same way yeah so well, you it's know weird. It, when i when i was when i was watched minari um with audio description and it will audio description automatically on, on apple audio description automatically read the subtitles to me it was jarring at first to get over yeah because i'm i want to hear i've i want to hear their voices i want to hear their actual voices uh, even though this was hard and and it was really frustrating i'm still glad i got to hear antoine and 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 everyone speak the language yeah. i, I want to hear the language even though i don't understand it so having voiceover you know and there and the 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 audio description is is express as expressive as it can be but having them talk over people you you just kind of kind of like get your brain used to it and after about 20 minutes i was okay i'm always just like the lack of headache i have makes it all worth it. exactly well and the fact that like i watched minati and could be in the discussion and and have conversations about it and stuff because i wanted to watch it Right. Uh, so, and I was able to access that media, and audio descriptions made it possible. Yeah. It's, so it's it's hard. It's, it's a trade off, definitely. I think you know, but I don't know if you're reading subtitles, you're not. You yeah, you're hearing the language. Mm-hmm. I mean, you are hearing it, but it's at the same time you're also your brain is more trying to process the English words being written right. down than it right. is really listening. You know, so if you could read very well, like sighted people can, but I I think. For me, it's just so, it's such a barrier. And then on top of that, like, I can use my vision to see what's going on in sure in broad strokes on mm-hmm. screen. I can see the composition and get a lot of, like, visual information that I do have out of it. And so when I'm reading, all I'm doing is hurting myself. <laughs> like, it's like the my vision oh, yeah. is so not made yeah. for reading. And it's definitely I not mean, made for reading small a, letters at the right, bottom of the screen. <laughs> right. In a perfect world, we could speak all the languages and watch all the foreign films I that know, we wanted that to be, without yeah. subtitles. But it's, like, literally never going to... I mean, even people who learn a bunch of languages, there's still languages they don't know. Like, there are people right, who speak 15 languages. There's, like, what is there, you know, 700... I don't sure. know, languages. Well, and, and, you know, French Canadian is different, or Quebecois French is different than France French. Theoretically. So, theor- theoretically. I yeah. don't know. I have I don't speak either French, so I don't know how much <laughs> of that is overblown or not. But um, but yeah, it, I mean, I imagine you could still understand each other, though. Both speak in French. I, I think so. <laughs> I mean, I've not heard, like, a side-by-side comparison of yeah. the two languages, but because I think... Uh, don't I don't know. Don't quote me. But I, th- I was gonna say I think Quebecois is its own is just a dialect of French. But I'm right. pretty sure it's it's branched off enough. It is its own thing. Well, that's what people say. But it's not like fully its own thing. I don't think it's not like an actual like mixed language mm. of like because 
I don't know, like, I guess would it be, it's not a pidgin language or anything. I don't think no. it's mixed with, mixed with English at no, all. No, I don't think so. So I mean, they speak a little bit of English in the film, but not much. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, there is like a radio broadcast that's right. in English. I yeah. Think, when, a couple of them. And there's like a song that's in English. There's a few songs, yeah. Which is also kind of weird because then it's like, I feel like if you hear, if there's a song in French played in a movie, you're like, well, I'm not listening to the lyrics <laughs> of the song because it's in French, so I don't understand. But I realized it's like weird on the other end of it where I'm like, now I'm really listening to the lyrics <laughs> of this song, which is not well, what you're, you're intending. Because your brain is kind of crazy. <laughs> Raving English. Exactly. I, oh yeah. my God, it's words that I understand. Oh my God. So yeah. now the next time I see a movie with a French song in it, I'll be like, French people must be so annoyed right now. <laughs> <laughs> They're just hearing the, the French lyrics. Um, but yeah, though they dub a lot of. Don't if France is the only country where they dub movies. Um, they dub well, like are, Hollywood are, movies. Are you talking dub it into French or? Yeah, they you... dub it into French. Um, whereas most movies will sh- do subtitles. They're not the only. Countries. They're not the only ones. Italy is pretty uh, fanatical about doing that too. They would rather dub a movie into Italian than have subtitles. I know, like in Costa Rica. They definitely don't do that. They'll just put subtitles on the movie. Yeah. Uh, Because I went to the movies in Costa Rica. And And that's exactly what they did. Yeah, see, I'm always like, well, it sucks for me when I'm traveling and want to see a movie. But great, I guess, for blind people in (laughs) Italy, like, who don't have to, like, not see any movies in English because they can't understand them. Um, But, yeah, this, I mean, it's, I wish that there was a... Uh, audio described version of this movie to watch. Yeah, I would like to hear better at what they were saying about what everyone was saying. I mean, I kind of sort of found myself checking in and checking out with the subtitles just because there was so much to look at. Yeah. And I... Yeah, I uh, think I did the opposite thing, which was like, yeah, it was why I had such a bad headache by the end of it. Sorry. <laughs> no, oh. no. I mean, I picked the movie, so you shouldn't be saying sorry. <laughs> don't, well, don't, don't you worry. Don't you worry. I got, I got you an English movie. <laughs> yes. Pick for this. I only week. like English stuff. <laughs> Just English. <laughs> Speak English. Speak oh. English. Oh my God, no. No, no. <laughs> please, no. Please keep speaking your beautiful languages. Uh, it's in my humble opinion, I think Americans like most other people who are around the world who are forced to learn English should be forced to learn another language. <laughs> yeah, it's just hard because no one's, yeah, no one's ever going to speak every language. No, but you should speak there one are or blind two. blind people in every, it is a weird problem because there are blind people everywhere and we can't read subtitles <laughs> mm-hmm. and there are a lot of languages. And so I think people are very against dubs, but, mm-hmm. but I don't know. In some ways it is like a weirdly I mean, accessible thing. Right. It depends. I, I really wanted to watch um, The Host, the it's super cool South Korean monster movie. Uh, but the monster is like a a, a metaphor for the environment and stuff. And it's actually really well done. It's great. It's one of my favorite ones to watch around Halloween or like if I'm feeling kind of kaiju or whatever. Anyway, um, there is a uh, there is a dubbed dub of that movie. Is the dub fantastic? Eh. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, But I but all along. What bothers me is if, if if the lip flaps, if the lips don't match up and it's really noticeable, yes, that's a pet peeve of mine. But what bothers me is I can tell just by the way it sounds, those are not the actual voices of the actual people. Yeah. And that, and there's a huge disconnect there. And that drives me crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's definitely, it's hard because I'm, I'm always just like, I can't read subtitles. So right, I don't have right. an option. No, right. And I'm not, oh, trust me. I am not, <laughs> I'm never going to say dubs are bad. I watch all of my anime dubbed. Right. Because there's yeah, no too. way. Like I'm going to, if I'm going to watch an anime, I'm going to watch it dubbed. Well, Sorry. And, and for me, I mean, this is, <laughs> this is probably our divide too, which is very funny because we always do this, but like, um, I'm always just like, well, but the people who wrote it, wrote it in the language that <laughs> People are speaking and sometimes subtitles because they don't have to match the way the lips are moving right. are more faithful to yes, the meaning. Absolutely. And so that sometimes pisses me off that we don't have access to the more meaningful thing, which is why sometimes I actually think that you should just read the subtitles mm-hmm. over people talking mm-hmm. because I think, you know, it 
it does solve the pro- it does solve the problem of like you still can hear the voice right. underneath, right? But you're getting to actually understand what people are saying, mm-hmm. and well, and with 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 movies like The Host, you know, now that I've watched the dub, if I'm going to put the host on in the background, if I'm going to rewatch the host or whatever, I can watch it in its native language because I know what's going on. Right. Once you I, have I know, right? I know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I know who all the characters. Are, I know what the story is. I know what the story means. Right. So now I'm like. Okay, cool, great. I mean, when um, I went and saw Pan's Labyrinth in theaters, and l- lucky for me, that movie is in Spanish, and I could understand about thirty percent without <laughs> having to read the subtitles, which was pretty cool. That's cool uh, yeah. because I literally couldn't see the subtitles. So the first right. time I saw Pan's Labyrinth, I only understood verbally thirty percent of what was happening. Yeah, I, the movie is so cool and so well done that like I get it. Like I don't necessarily, I didn't necessarily need to know one hundred percent of what everyone is saying, and I. I own Pan's Labyrinth anyway, so like I've seen it a dozen times. But yeah, yeah. I think that's, I at a certain point was just like, you know, I don't want to see any subtitle movies in the theaters unless I can get audio description just because it was just so, it makes me so frustrated and sad because it will, it does hurt a lot. And then I feel kind of like, You know, when I was a kid, like, I was, I actually had people were like, you can't sit close to the TV or you hurt yourself. So I I had the same problem. Like, uh, which is just, first of all, makes no sense. No. That's not a real thing. That's just not not real. And also horrible to do to a kid, especially because that kid could be blind. Like, you don't know. I was blind. (laughs) We had, we had a conga line of daycare parents at my house because my mom ran a daycare out of her house. And that's exactly every single goddamn well-meaning mother or father every single fucking time. And my mom was just like, she's blind. That's why. Because she's blind. Also, just like, first of all, like, it, I wish that we could get more people going blind from that stuff because then maybe we'd have more <laughs> rights. But, like, it, that's not, like, a real thing. And, like, also, no, it's, like, what it's, it reminds me a lot of, like, vaccines cause autism. It's, like, mm, yes. first of all, makes no sense and literally has no, just not true at all. But also, like, what is the problem with your kid having autism? Like, what is your deal that you're right, so there's upset nothing wrong. that that could be true? Mm-hmm. Same thing goes for kids. Like, it's the exact same thing with, like, being too close to TV. It's not going to make your kid blind. And if your kid's blind love your kid like there's no yep. fucking reason not it, to. absolutely and i mean <laughs> i'm still sitting 10 inches away from the tv to this day yeah and, <laughs> and i i'm fine and it's actually made me less it's made my eyes not as p- in pain and honestly i care about that mm-hmm. way more than like going blind because right. i'm not like like squinting and hurting right. myself I, you know and i actually there are times when I really enjoy watching something on my phone or on my iPad because that is a screen I can put right up next to my nose. Right, right. And, uh, it's, and it's fine. Well, and and I, in this room that uh, listeners cannot see at all, but <laughs> and Melissa is blind, so <laughs> she can't see it either. Um, but I have a TV that has on um, wheels, so uh, mm-hmm. that is uh, what I do is I'll just sit in a chair and then I will put uh, this big TV right next to my face so that with the little table that has wheels on it and that way I can still get up um, Mm -hmm. by moving the table and put them next to my face. Mine is also on a low table but just easily accessed uh, put in a spot that's easy to pull a chair up to. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. yeah, That's another way of doing it. (laughs) I I don't know why I'm I'm like I like that it's on wheels. No, I think that's a great idea. I I think that's really great having it on wheels. I might uh, steal your idea for my new room but yeah because <laughs> it is it does make it easier to have like a good comfy chair and then you can like really get it as close mm-hmm. as you want it mm-hmm. like right well, up in, next to you. in any space that I've lived in whether it's dorm by myself or sharing apartments or houses with people or whatever there's the living room and then there's the tv and there's always some kind of a chair right there next to the tv and people are like what why is that th- oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> well that yeah the we have that i insisted <laughs> conrad and i have a little um love seat that well he had the good idea of having a love seat because i was like i don't want the one chair because it just makes me feel like right, i'm a kid so and i'm lonely. isolated yes. and alone because yes. everyone will be like okay well you can have the one chair um and so then i was like okay well i guess i'm away from everyone else that i care around <laughs> everyone's having fun behind me cool um so so my, I, have I told this story in the podcast? I feel like I told a lot when it happened. I don't know. But, I don't um, think so. 
<laughs> but, but yeah, my, my very sweet partner, Conrad, was like, we're going to get a love seat then. <laughs> we're going to put it right next to the TV. Perfect. So he's a sweetie. And it's very easy to move because it's small. So mm-hmm. you can like, like sometimes I'll do like exercise videos on the oh, TV. Yeah, and sure. so then I can move it back so I can do that. Yeah. I'm, I'm, <laughs> it's very important to me to have as much movable things. Yeah. So you could get super like closer than is necessary for walking around. It's kind of like, it's like the little home mentality of like moving furniture and you know to fit mm-hmm. in a smaller space i feel like for blind people it's like because we have to be closer to things mm-hmm. having that movable furniture that's very easy to move is really helpful and like being able to both have a tv watching space that then can become more of a like social space or something very easily but i you know i think there's i don't think there are solutions of like just very permanent furniture that can really always help us like I think it is helpful to have more movable spaces is you know which is funny because we don't like when things are moved too much I know right? <laughs> <laughs> but I now we and now I'm just making us seem like very uh high maintenance but you know the world's <laughs> not made for us so able people mm-hmm. are very high maintenance as well they just have an entire world that accommodates their high maintenance um so that's my uh feel anyway antoine yeah, um, way to go <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's a movie about a six-year-old boy um <laughs> i don't know what what is what are other things we should talk about about this movie <laughs> since we've gotten far off track <laughs> i was reading this paper that someone wrote about how it's like because he is a lot of the recordings are from him like antoine is also partly a filmmaker in the movie and i'm like okay i guess i see that yeah that's cool that's pretty cool i mean his if, if you you know they're kind of a team they're both bringing something to the table yeah uh, in a way she's got the camera and he's got the the tape recorder and they're collaborating on this thing and he might not you know, he's sick so he might not understand fully the art of collaboration but right there this piece has um some of him and some of her yeah, it is. It is a very much feels collaborative. Yeah, I, w- I mean, the fact that he's six, I'm like, it would be kind of cool to see an adult blind person making a movie, you know, like there is that. Sure. Like, it's always a struggle when we watch movies about kids because it's like you want to paint. It's important to have some media that paints that picture, but then you because disabled people are so often infantilized, it's always hard to like balance that with like how do we also tell adult stories in a like Mm -hmm. because sometimes Mm -hmm. making it a kid is like a good out for a bunch of stuff that like you know blind adults have a bunch of problems that you don't necessarily have when like in the same way or it's pressing when you're a kid so it's like you're dealing with different problems at different times in your life and as you grow you get to see different ways in which the world's like does or does not accommodate you and the story becomes much more interesting and complicated as you get older and it's not to say it's not interesting when you're younger but I think there's layers of complexity that you see the more layers of complexity there are the less we see good portrayals of blind people Mm -hmm. I feel like it's like the older a blind person is the more you're just like okay this is just (laughs) not good um which is sad I mean I would but I think part of that is because we don't have enough blind adults like Mm -hmm. especially people Mm -hmm. who are blind as children because like we've watched like one documentary about somebody who's going blind but it's like definitely we watched we watched more than one we watched a couple actually like um, going blind was one of them what was the yes other one? going blind blue i would count blue yeah yeah one. yeah but they're both like definitely adults like, yeah, oh totally yes fully yes. adults fully, fully formed adults right right when yes. they went blind and yes. not just when not just that they're adults making the movie they're adults as they were going blind right and so i think that that like well, and, changes and, the narrative a little bit too. sure and that's what makes this piece really cool it's like it's a film obviously but i it just feels so much like an art piece, too. I mean, it is, I, yeah. Yeah, and that's what makes this really cool because it's just unfiltered Antoine. It is so him. It's so much of of who he is and how and his imagination and wh- how he plays and how he experiences the world. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's probably easier to make it like a mood piece documentary observational movie about like a child and the mm-hmm. <laughs> whimsical nature of that. Whereas an adult who's like, oh, you know, well, gotta get an, accommodations for my job. Adult. Yeah, and, like you know, like it's not. There's a the, lot. It's the very world, less whimsical, right? And the world is so 
big and new and so many different things for him to experience. Yeah, it's interesting, though, because, like, that is the blind experience in a way, too, is that we're always discovering yeah. that, like, that mm -hmm. aspects people grow out of that. But I feel like blind people get to live in that our whole lives because everything's always new. We don't have, like, we don't have that same sense of, like, well, this is what this is and this is what this is and the world is all just kind of the same. Like, it's like, no, the, everywhere you go, things are different well, and there's stuff to right. observe. And we, <laughs> right, and you can have a piece of art. I mean, I was listening to... um Hades Town, the album Hades Town on the bus uh, last night, uh, and I'm just sitting there thinking. Well, first of all, I adore it. I adore Hades Town. I love everything about it. But I was thinking, it's so interesting because the way I'm experiencing this piece of art and the way I'm experiencing the music is completely different to how a sighted person would, and the, the way I would experience seeing the show, uh, which is coming apparently next year to Portland. I'm so stoked. Uh, but yeah, I. I could go with a sighted friend and we would we would experience it two totally different ways. Yeah. And sure, that's art. Like art is subjective. Blind, whether you're disabled or abled or whatever, two people are going to look at the same piece of art and have two can have two totally different reactions. But um, I, as far as a, as a blind person goes, uh, I, th I think I just experience things like music on a completely different level yeah. than, uh, than some sighted people. It's like... I mean, I think it's like you get a much richer experience, especially when you just have different perception than what's considered normative. <laughs> I think <laughs> you just have a much, I don't know, I feel like you're, you have a richer perspective because everyone has a different, brings their life and the things they've experienced mm -hmm. in their life to work. Mm -hmm. And we still do that as well. We just also bring in a different, a literally different way of seeing the world, <laughs> like a literally different way. Um, so I think that that, yeah, I mean, I think yeah, we, we yeah. but that's kind of like, uh, navigating the world in a way of like noticing things for the first time yes all which happens all the time yeah all of the time oh my god I can't I can't even tell you how <laughs> like oh okay okay I was so your stop the stop I get off to come to your house 41st street so I was looking there uh, I just got my badges for Rose City Comic Con in the mail this weekend nice. I'm fucking stoked uh but there is a party they're having a pre-show party of the thursday the 9th at weird uh at the the meadery weird did you know that that m meadery is literally right across from that bus stop you live you live within walking distance of it that and the a food cart called the poutine palace I which know. i really want to go to i know uh yeah i didn't know <laughs> or walking downtown uh past the same place because i'm a very one i'm blind i'm a very one path person right, but i'll yes, notice yeah but i'm like oh my god i'll notice oh shit like that store has been here for years and right. i'm like oh my god it's here or you know a, a, a new park that i wanted that i want to go to oh my god it's right over in this area that i totally know and i just had no idea that park was there yeah there's so much like yeah that happens to me all the time and I think that that so yeah it's it is really interesting how I don't think that side of people have that same experience like they just kind of like they drive around and they just passively <laughs> see where things are and then they just get like a, a mental map and like the idea of you know living in Portland the fact that we could probably live here our whole lives and constantly be like wow never knew that was I there know. they're like side of people who probably just you know they eventually just learn <laughs> where the, what things are sure I mean, like, I just I've lived here for a long time I'll get off like the times that my bus has gotten up on the wrong stop mm -hmm. that is like like if the they get rerouted or something mm. like all of a sudden it's a completely entirely different universe than what I'm like what, what even if it's like a bus route I've done like thousands of times I'm still like completely like it, it's totally different everything is totally different I feel like that is weirdly like yeah, just that child thing of like everything is so new and you have so much. Every stimuli is completely new and interesting. And I feel like we never outlive that in a way. Um, we're just always <laughs> rediscovering the world and all the things in it, which I don't know. I think sometimes it can feel very, you know, obviously when I've gone on a, off on the wrong bus stop, I've every single time I think ended up in tears and most blind people I know end oh, up in yeah, tears. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So like, there's, there's a horrible downside to all of this, right. too. But I absolutely. think so. Sometimes when I am in tears, I try to maybe think about how, like, 
yeah, like, but also you can never fully feel like you just are jaded to some place. Like mm-hmm. you're always discovering it, even if sometimes that can <laughs> become a real problem. Um, <laughs> but, you know, and I think I think we do probably focus more on the sad parts of it. I like the idea of thinking of it as like <laughs> kind of, you know, like we never get we never grow up in a way of like not in like an infantilizing way, but we just always mm-hmm. get to have that excitement of discovering new things <laughs> that we never knew about um but yeah I mean I think also just getting a sense of the world too as a kid it's like you're trying to we have I mean cognitively we just have so much more like mental mind maps of how the world Mm -hmm. works that you don't have as a kid and like that I think is really what getting older as a blind person is is just just really cognitively understanding the world in so many ways and we do it more than sight of people because we have to use cognitive power a lot of times instead of eyes to like understand where things are like remembering where things are and like you know in the world and all these ways that we do that so I think that that is how we get older in a lot of ways it's like very brain you know centered but it is interesting to um yeah, just to think about how we have that kind of adventure. We can get to maintain that adventure spirit. I mean, every day you walk out of the house is an it's adventure. It's exciting. <laughs> it is. It is. It's, it is. It's exciting. It's it's great. And thank goodness we live in a city that has a a re- truly a really awesome public transit system. I mean, yeah, we're allowed to bitch and moan because we ride it every single day. But right, look, right. We but do. Look, like it's it it's so amazing and empowering to look up an address and be like mm, I can get there and also yeah. I can get myself home it's, it's true great. it's like, really nice like last like last night I had to go out to Oregon City to do this show yeah and I didn't get home until 11 30 at night but you know what I got myself there and I got myself back yeah it is really now that we're getting back out and I'm like I all, I somewhat hate the bus, but oh my god, am I so happy to be outside of my house <laughs> yes. and to like, and you know, during the pandemic, like Conrad has been driving me when we go places, we'll go there together and he'll drive me. And now that my life is opening back up again, it's like, there's something so empowering about taking the bus. Like, you're just mm-hmm. like, yeah, I don't fucking need to wait on anyone. And like, you know, I appreciate getting rides, but there's oh, something so yeah. nice as a contrast to that to be like, you know, this is, this is convenient right now mm-hmm. to get a ride in certain circumstances mm-hmm. but also like I don't have to like I can just right. get home if and I, I mean, need to right and I mean my co-host you know was super nice and and you know totally could have offered me a ride or whatever like they live over on um Powell and Foster which is I have to blow right through there on the bus to get back to my house but I was just kind of like nah, I'm good I'm good like I'll just I'll walk down to the transit center which was four minutes away from where I was and I'll just catch the bus <laughs> Yeah, so. I mean, in a way, it's like we're adults. We don't need, like, a child to be driven around. We can be like Antoine <laughs> driving the car, but, like, in an actual realistically blind right. adult way. Right. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, I think that that, um, yeah, I don't know. There there can be a lot of empowering things. I, I feel like this podcast, it's interesting, this episode, I'm realizing as both of us are starting to, like, I feel like this is the first week I've had started to have a life again. I know, right? Um, it feels great. It's amazing. Yes. <laughs> and I feel it, like if you listen to this podcast, this is almost like how we were at the beginning of the show. Oh, you're right. Because <laughs> we used to have lives, and then oh we just God. didn't for most it of this podcast. It slowly stopped. Yeah. Holy smokes. Um, But, yeah, I... I think this was a really great pick. It's just yeah. was interesting and experimental and vibey and uh, I dug it. It's vibey. I think if I would if I think I would recommend it to people definitely, but just go in it not trying to I think the documentary is almost I mean it's technically correct, but I think uh, Given what we think of as documentary at this current time period, I would say don't really think of it as a documentary in the same way you would like yeah. what we yeah. right now is the more popular form of documentary right. making it's, in this year. It's, you know, right? It's not a it's not a flashy docu series. It's not Errol Morris. It's not uh, it's even an, like Pick of the like Linner was a more recent right. documentary watch. That's very yeah. It's like yeah. There's 
It is not like that at all. It is extremely vibey. It is much closer to like Lost in Translation or so, you know, <laughs> so yeah. Sofia Th- Coppola movies, yes, what it yes. feels like. Things just happen. <laughs> yeah. It they is. just happen. Yeah, yeah. It's very, and it's just, if you don't fully understand what's going on, that's like almost part of the point of it, you know, if it feels like you're like, is what's real, you know, it's like, oh yeah, that's what a kid feels like. So, um, yeah, I, but I, I think, well, we're kind of, we're, we're now inching into it. So do you I want think so. let's, let's. Let's get our yeah, out there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, you go first. Cool, cool, cool. Easy choice, easy choice. Uh, 2500 Nice. For me. Yeah, absolutely. It just uh, everything we just said, we just reiterated. Basically, it's joyful. Um, it's just it's just beautiful just to see Antoine being Antoine. And it's fun to be inside his head. Yeah. And see that, oh, wow, I am normal. <laughs> like, I... Other kids play like this. I'm I'm not in this sense I am not unique. Yeah. It's just nice to feel like uh I you're you're part of the club. Yeah. And um yeah, I just I I really I really enjoyed it. I really liked it. Yeah. I mm-hmm. I think I'm going to give it a 2300 which okay. is pretty good in Sky. <laughs> yeah, in Skyland. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um I think I think the one thing is I would it's and this is like not, I think, the fault of the movie, but I, I kind of wanted to know more about his life and understand him as a kid. And like, and I think that the movie was not trying to do that. And I think that's admirable. Um, and so I, I, I'm going to put it down to personal preference or, or not. Yeah, maybe like a personal fascination. It's like, I just really, maybe it's from not getting to be blind, like being blind at five, but not getting to be blind or 66. But like, I wasn't getting to openly be blind. So there's Mm -hmm. something about I was looking forward to watching a kid like learn how to or not learn how to be blind but like getting to be in blindness at that age was something that I wanted. And so it was like, like, it, I I was excited to watch that happen, and the movie is not really doing that. It's much more about like just the mind of a six year old and the kind of non linear, nonsensical fashion that that comes in, which is, I think, a very it's a really cool way to frame the documentary. I just personally was like, oh, but I want to know more about his life. <laughs> um, right, like he oh, seemed yeah. like a very yeah. cool kid, and I was, and it's it. You know, in a way, I was also, like, trying to find out what it was 2008, so Mm -hmm. he would be, I think, and what would he be like? Because he's six, so he would be maybe, like, 19 now, maybe. So I I, I feel like I was trying to, there's no information online about what's going on with him now. I guess a (laughs) 19-year-old is not necessarily super, you know, it's not going to be, like, well-known or whatever. You know, it's, like, in college, maybe. But, But I... I feel like you don't, you can't really know what he would be like now or really like how he would grow up. And I was, I also wanted to know more about that. I was, I was interested to, to see more of his life. And, and I think that that was my own fault for going into it with those expectations when the movie was not interested in doing that. And I think also, I also can't really fault it for, you know, sometimes I get mad at movies for what they're trying to do, but I think this was a sweet, I liked I like the idea of what he was trying to do. I just wanted to better know him as a kid. I like I wanted to see more of his social life and and understand more of what he was going through and the frustrations he had mm-hmm. and and when he does like cry, I wanted to understand that better. Like yeah. wanted to know how it was affecting his social life and I think in some ways that part of the movie was a little bit more, you know, like we said it kind of they like, went there but then they never really fully resolved they didn't resolve it in a way but you didn't like because kids can kind of like be like we're mad and then we're not mad (laughs) but we didn't even fully see that arc it almost felt kind of like jarring entirely like they just were all of a sudden totally fine and it wasn't a moment of them being like well sorry I'm not mad at you anymore you know like a weird kid thing it really just felt like we missed a part of what happened Uh, so I think that 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 aspect of it I think it would have been really interesting to see more of the like grounded stuff with him as a kid but I still think that this did a really great job at what it was <laughs> what it was trying to do, and I think it was fun. Right. Uh, yeah. I, I have no problem recommending it to people who really like documentaries, uh, yeah. this, with the caveat being this is not going to feel like the doc- – if you're thinking about a, a mainstream documentary, this is not going to feel like that. Right. But I think people who like documentaries would really enjoy this. People who want to learn more about blindness, or at least the blind – 
like like we said, this won't give you concrete facts about what it is like to be blind, but it, it it's very much about the experience, the lived in experience of a of a blind person. Yeah, and like if you like do a lot of work with kids too, I feel like there's Sif and mm-hmm. has that, you know, charming thing of like. I don't know, teaching kids and stuff. I'm just like, I just love how kids are so, <laughs> it's just so weird. And then like, there's just such a joy you get from watching them interact with each other and just the the way that their consciousness is <laughs> so kind of different <laughs> and, and light. And, and there's, I don't know, you can get some joy just watching kids be kids sometimes. Oh, absolutely. Of like, yeah, oh, yeah, that, that yeah. playfulness that they have is fun. So, so I think this is also good for that <laughs> if you're having that vibe if you were like a teacher like me if you taught kids but don't have any kids and so like during the pandemic if you (laughs) lost your job like I did and didn't get to hang out with kids anymore this Mm -hmm. is a good way to get your fix of like watching kids be ridiculous and silly Um, definitely but yeah and yeah I think it's a it's a very it's a cool movie I if anyone knows Antoine now I'd love I really do I genuinely yeah, want to what, know what's going on with him what's like, up with Antoine right very yeah. seriously I want to know that absolutely so, yeah <laughs> um yes maybe he's a filmmaker now right maybe or he's making his own documentaries sure or writing his own detective stories or a journalist or something yeah or maybe he's just like going to school for engineering or some random thing that like you know kids i guess he's gen z i was gonna say millennials are expected to do but he's gen z um so but yeah seriously though it was i would like to know i want to know what's going on with him um uh, that's antoine yeah yeah we liked it we liked, we liked the movie. it really liked it yeah uh, this is good. good choice good choice so we're gonna really love next week's movie. yeah so oh what is it? so gonna love it actually you have a choice Oh, for no. next week's Choose movie. Choose your own adventure. Choose your own adventure. I I have brought you two equally shit movies <gasps> for next week, one of which has a 17% on Rotten Tomatoes and one of which has a 3% on Rotten Tomatoes. Actually, I think the other one might be lower than 17%. I haven't checked it lately. Okay. But they're both bad. Um, so uh, one of them was recommended by my roommate and the other one... I went down a very long and strange YouTube rabbit hole and just am dying to watch the whole thing. Oh my gosh. Okay, so the first one is uh, the Shane Dawson vehicle, Be Cool. Okay. (laughs) This one has a really interesting backstory. Basically, very quickly to sum it up, Shane Dawson was on a reality show. He's he's a YouTuber and famous YouTuber. And he was on a reality show called The Chair. And he it was about him and this other filmmaker who were competing um, to make the same movie. Basically, they had um, identical screenplays. They could change them however they wanted. But they were making the movie. And they uh, their movie got um, greenlit. Their movies got greenlit and produced. And uh, it, they were just, it was kind of an experiment just to see like what these two new filmmakers would do, basically. One of them made a imperfect yet very sensitive movie. And the other one was Shane Dawson. <laughs> <laughs> so this movie is like infamously bad okay, uh, for its portrayals of everything. Disability, um, orient, sexual orientation, um, just everything. Everybody looks bad. So we get real mad. Wait, we'll, we'll get, was, we'll get real mad. Did you say the name of it yet? It's called Be... Or sorry, oh, it's be called cool, Not said. Cool. I'm oh, so, it's Not did Cool. Did I say Be Cool? I'm sorry. I think you did. It's called Not Cool. Okay, so it is not cool. Apparently. It is not cool. The other movie is one that my roommate recommended called Love, Weddings, and Other Disasters. This one is some bullshit comedy that she really liked that happens to have uh, Diane Keaton and Jeremy Irons in it. And Diane Keaton plays uh, the mother of a, of this bride who's getting married or whatever. Okay, and so we don't really... So it's just kind of like, but it sounds like it'll be bad. I guess it has a, was like that said, the one with three, the seven percent? That's three percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Oh, so that's even worse than the other one. I th- I think so, but the other one is much worse. <laughs> okay. So we don't trust so Rotten Tomatoes. I don't, I don't trust Rotten Tomatoes. So, or my roommate. Uh, so pick your poison. Oh, What do you want to wow. do first? Because either way, we're going to do them both. I know. I'm like, we should have like a wanna, listener. What do you want to watch first? I would like to do Not Cool. Yeah. 
that was good. I was hoping you'd say that. Because <laughs> it sounds very bad. And it's I'm excited. It's so fucking bad. I'm Amen. so excited. Especially after, and I'll probably pick some other weird, like, foreign documentary where it's with children, like, whimsical. Oh, like, I love it. Because that's very me. No, I love it. I, it. Your picks are amazing. And you you, you hold this podcast up. And, but you pick all the movies <laughs> I, I bring, love talking about. I bring about. all the trash. <laughs> yeah. I love um, talking about your movies. You love talking about mine. Yes. So it's very uh, dynamic. Not Cool is streaming available to rent. Sorry, it's not streaming. It's available to rent on the usual suspects, Apple, Amazon, and YouTube. The problem is we're going to, I'm just going to be like, literally want to make the joke every single time. Like, oh, it's not cool. It's not streaming. <laughs> Seems not like cool. It's going to be very annoying because it's not even that funny of a joke and I'm going to have to make it a million times. But that sounds not cool, but a lot of fun. Uh, I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, and there's, like I said, be careful because I went down a horrible rabbit hole just <laughs> watching all this shit about this movie. So um, Okay, so that's, yeah. so you will also have a lot of context. I, I'll have a lot of context. I'm, ex- I'm yeah. very excited. Okay, this will be fun. Awesome. That's next week. This week, we still have what we're blindsided by. Right. Um, I can go first. Yes, go for time. it. Mm-hmm. So I am bringing a movie. Yay. Um, which is called Nine Days. Um, it is... <sighs> in theaters now i saw it my mom was just visiting when she was on this podcast last week as you could tell she was just visiting and while she was here um we went and saw it um we were actually we were going to see paw patrol for a while um (laughs) then we decided instead to see nine days and i feel guilty about the movie choices i bring um (laughs) Uh, yeah, no, but we didn't actually see Paw Patrol. Okay, good. That's a whole other conversation. Really we'll because have. that Paw Patrol is so weird. I have weird feelings about it because oh, I am a God. police officer. I think I'm a cop in that show. Or in, yeah, because there's Sky as one of the <laughs> Paw Patrol. So oh I, but I think she, I think she's a cop. Um, and she's I, pink, which I, I find offensive. I I have no fucking idea. <laughs> um, but anyway, I also again work with kids, and I have mm-hmm. a lot of kids will tell me about Sky the dog from Paw Patrol that oh think it's a police God. officer. No, I don't know. I could be wrong about that. I have to look it up. But because we, we didn't see Paw Patrol, we saw Nine Days, which is, is a much. It's, it is exactly the same. No, um, it is about um, like the Nine Days represents this kind of like world after. It's not an afterlife because it's like a before life. And the plot is that um, there's someone whose job it is is to interview nine souls to get to decide which one of them will be born oh, and cool. then okay. he like has all these TVs set up to watch the people who have been born in the, the like he picked to be born he watches their life and then when they die he has to pick a new person to be born and it's like that is basically the premise but they're kind of their souls are represented by actual people um you know that are adults that are kind of them at it it's not a lot of it is left ambiguous in a way that makes it like you're not as focused on plot holes like i kind of like conrad and i were talking about it my mom was like oh i wanted to know more about the world but it's kind of the the way that it's set up it's like they tell you just enough for the plot to work but not so much that you're like oh but wait how would this work and how would you know you're not you don't pick it apart because they just tell you just as much as you need to know but there but yeah so we have like the um the the representation of their souls that are kind of like going through this weird interview process and the interviewer is like someone who got to be a human being at some point and like there are other people who never got chosen that are kind of like they don't get to make the final decision and so this Ooh. is this is a lot of uh plot i hope i'm not giving too much plot no stuff. no i this, um, this sounds really interesting i'm getting kind of i don't know good place vibes yeah off it's of it. well oh what was the two that conrad was like this would be if oh now i can't remember what his if the oh right right it was uh i think did he say he must have said survivor survivor means the good place oh um, i'm here for this yeah, okay. yeah yeah i think i'm pretty sure that's because it is similar to that uh yeah it simply has a weird <laughs> kind of a reality show vibe but it's it is um, I will I will stop giving too much plot stuff away because there's a lot of things that are kind of, you know, built up in the movie that, you know, I don't want to say too much, but it's really worth it. 
um I, we talked we wound up talking about it like the three of us talked about it for like two hours after the movie oh, wow. like we probably spent more t- just as much time talking about it as the movie is long um and so it is definitely something that has just a lot of uh depth and the, and if you can get conrad me and my mom to all like a movie that is a very successful movie because <laughs> we have all very different kinds of taste and also not a lot of overlap and so you know that's quite quality if we all really liked it um and didn't think it was like overly weird i mean it's a weird plot so it's like i mean maybe weird's not the right answer but it didn't feel like it didn't make sense like it felt very grounded in the plot that it gave but it's also like super about humanity and and consciousness and and yeah it was and and, like toxic masculinity a very cool movie go see it it's called nine days um and i will stop spoiling it because it's definitely worth (laughs) seeing it and and then we could talk about it for two hours so you can always hit me up after you've seen it and we'll Heck talk yeah. about it <laughs> I, i'd love to i need a real good uh thinker because i've the, the the past couple of movies i've seen i've i have enjoyed but they've definitely been like tentpole blockbusters and it would be really nice yeah. to see some something a little smaller although um i'm all in for the green knight <laughs> that movie's amazing <laughs> That's uh yeah that was one of the ones we were debating going into. Oh my into. god, it's so good. It's so good. It's so ambiguous and weird and and stunning and ponderous and it's great. It's okay, so good. Well, Connor and I it. have to see that and Pig at some point. So yes, before I've, they I've already leave. seen I've already seen The Green Knight twice. So oh, we should, wow. should Okay. Go. Yeah. Uh, but my actual recommendation besides The Green Knight uh, <laughs> uh, is a video game that I actually Ooh. I beat uh, last night. I finished it. Nice. Uh, it's a very short game. So it's called Boyfriend Dungeon. <gasps> Ooh. Okay. <laughs> so, look, I don't play dating simulators. I <laughs> don't enjoy that. It, plus, it's a lot of text. It's a lot of fucking reading, oh, and really? I'm not going to do yeah. it. Uh, but I also just, I don't, I don't enjoy romantic comedies all that much. I don't really enjoy romance novels, although I'm very slowly coming around on stuff like that. But, eh, I'm trying. But anyway, this game really got me in because, uh, yes, it's a dating sim, but in this particular dating sim... You date your weapons. <laughs> what? So, okay, so you move to this town right for the summer, Ver- Verona Beach, and you're 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 just doing whatever in this town. And you you go. Everybody likes to go to the dungeon, which is <laughs> where all like the combat happens and stuff. So you go to the dungeon, um, and you find these weapons because obviously you need a weapon to go through the dungeon, right? So <laughs> yeah. so you're fighting all these monsters and stuff, and and you find out that your weapons, um, you find an uh, I think they call it an it's like a fencing sword. I thought it was a rapier, but it's actually an epee something. I'm, I know I'm pronouncing it wrong. Anyway, turns out to be this super hot businessman um, <laughs> named Isaac. And then you find a talwar, which is a kind of like scimitar, who turns out to be this like club kid. Uh, and then you find this dagger who turns out to be um, this super cool artist named Valeria, who I'm totally dating in the, <laughs> or I was dating in the game um you can date them all I mean there there's like seven weapons you can find oh one of them is a cat there's a pair of brass knuckles that is a cat um That's so funny it's weird it's very weird it's so weird and I really enjoyed it and it's it's a lot of fun and especially for someone who's never played a dating simulator before <laughs> uh this was really cool and uh it's not there if you're looking for for relationships especially if you're looking for something with a lot of depth you won't find it here yeah. this is just you know everybody wants you and wants to date you and <laughs> uh you get to you know b- battle monsters and stuff now there is there's been a bit of controversy around the game um the, the antagonist of the game um is a, is a stalker basically and you you go on a date with them and it doesn't work out and they won't leave you alone oh that's scary uh right it is really scary because it could be really triggering for some people i have not been in enough relationships to have had this happen to me so it didn't it personally didn't i would hope that's not me. about the quantity of relationships you've been i know in. you're right sorry <laughs> that's, no, no, i didn't mean it like that i know no. yeah um <laughs> i've i've personally never experienced that so yeah, i yeah. i i didn't find it triggering uh, but some people absolutely yeah. would, and they have a they have a content advisory at the beginning of the game. That's good. Um, they're yeah, the studio itself is taking a lot of flack for for this and how they handled it. But honestly, I don't think all of it is deserved because 
this character that you have to deal with, this plot is integral to the story. Yeah. So well, they're they're not just doing it to do it. Also, yeah. I mean, if you have a content warning, like that is, you know, for some people it might be fun to play who have had stalkers because I know that talking to people who've had stalkers, like that would be great to get to play a game where you could kill them <laughs> like, <laughs> with weapons. I mean, I think that would be very comforting for people <laughs> as well. So I don't, I'm not, I mean, I don't know exactly how the controversy mm-hmm. is, but that seems like if there is a content warning so people can make an educated decision. Right. Right, on if they right. want to play it or not. And, but. Yeah, and a lot of people who are really up in arms about this haven't even played the game. So I'm like, oh, well. I am wanted to at least play the game before I even decide to take a side, and I side with the studio. Yeah. I'm like, you... you what is you the know. complaint? Just that it has material? Just that the, the material itself is in the, is in the game, and uh, some people don't feel that, like the content warning that they had put out was good enough. What was the... What did it say? I mean, it basically says this game includes depictions of stalking, emotional manipulation. Um, Wait, how? What's how is that not good enough? <laughs> it's saying exactly what's right. In it. it says exactly what's in the game, and then it says play with care. So I don't see the problem with that. that <laughs> no, there, there isn't a problem. And unfortunately, the, the 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 actor, the voice actor who plays the antagonist in the game, is also getting a lot of hate. Oh, for his gosh. and I'm like that's a character that he played y'all yeah, wait that's really confusing and weird I don't even understand that like well it's like it's like going after it's like you see the, you see the actor who played I don't know Joffrey on Game of Thrones or whatever really bad person and or or the, or the guy who yeah. played Simon or the guy who played Ramsey Bolton and you you see them on the street and you just kick their ass right like, it's they, just like that's they're playing that's character. not them like right like they're I'm they're I'm hoping they're decent human beings in real life like you know you can't you can't go after somebody for that yeah um, that's but, but unfortunately bizarre. this actor is like experiencing a lot of hate for this and that's really that's not really fair sad. and it's really sad and and i have played the game and it's fine is it like <laughs> are people saying it's like flippant about it or something like what is i don't which like i don't know it doesn't sound it's not like it doesn't sound like it's glorifying no stalking. it's not it's absolutely not no 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 you don't no it's not it's it's absolutely not what the characters actions in the game are not glorified in any way the they're frowned upon by the other characters in the game right you know and it's it's gross but it never gets graphic yeah i mean but i think like having a content warning and making it not seem gratuitous if that's the main plot of the right. game well what people are mad about is that you can't choose an option in the game to like excise that character from the game or excise that content from the game because it is an integral part of the story that they wanted to tell oh yeah well then so it, that's, that's why that's you have a content problem. warning I, like exactly for me, there's certain things i don't want to hear podcasts about sure. so that's why i like having a content warning so i can skip the bug you know right. like, well, even, like that's why you have content warnings right well even for us you know if we're talking about a movie or doc that features like self-harm or or you know things like that you always say hey this might, this one might not be for you, and yeah. this game might not be for you. If that if that makes you if that triggers you, don't play this game. I'm I'm right. saying, people should be know. able to make the choice for themselves, and for some people who like have had that experience, it might be very nice to have. Like I think that's the part that's very confusing to me is it's like people deal with trauma in a bunch of different ways, and there's nothing wrong with wanting to not play something that has stalking, which is why you should be warned and not play you know so you could not play it mm-hmm. but then for some people it might be nice to like actually go into the trauma and like right. you know be able to act it out in a safe environment like that can also be nice for people like both and but people know themselves the best and it shouldn't be anyone else telling them they just need to have the right information so they can right. decide if it's I something mean, they want to do or not <laughs> to be honest like the art like the whole thing about dating and relationships really I wouldn't say triggers me, but I feel really ewy about it. I don't enjoy it, but I'm playing this game. I'm in a safe environment. I can make those choices, right? And yeah. and have and have that experience. And I, I yeah, I think what mostly what the co- what the controversy is is centering on is the people don't think the content warning is good enough, and they and the people don't understand why this content you can't play the game without the content being excised from it, and they're just not getting it like it's yeah this is the piece of art that they made this is the story that they want to tell right if you don't like it don't play the also, game weapons that your weapons being your boyfriend seems like it has some <laughs> or domestic girlfriends. <laughs> or girlfriends well or, no, or non-binary this nice. also this game is super lgbtqia plus friendly 
I it's from not awesome. playing this game, I approve of it, and I think the controversy is silly. We <laughs> should we should play it together. It is fabulous. It sounds it sounds like a lot of fun. But yeah, I feel like if you're if it's about weapons, that you're dating weapons, so there's probably like the <laughs> fact that it has some sort of domestic violence stalking <sighs> vibe to it that makes sense to me because that feels like very those go hand in hand in my the mind dude, of like the dude who's stalking you owns a weapon shop named Naked Steel. Oh wow. It's so much fun. <laughs> Well, it sounds, I guess it's trivializing because, you know, serious issues have to be very serious and you can never I, laugh I, about trauma because it's I not guess. like, I mean, I don't know. Someone yeah. with trauma, I find it very you know, helpful to laugh about it, but that's Right, fine. right. But like, <laughs> it's a dating sim where you date your weapons. Come on. They, we're not going for realism here. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. well, that sounds like a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. The game is called Boyfriend Dungeon. Uh, it's on Nintendo Switch. I don't know if it's on any other platforms I because I played it on Nintendo Switch and it's on sale uh, in the eShop right now. So nice. if you if you so choose, find a friend or you know throw a couple of bucks their way. I feel like this whole podcast has had a lot of whimsy, even in our recommendations. They're both very <laughs> whimsical as well. So I like that. Um, but nice. Um, I don't know. That's a podcast, right? We did. We it. did it. Yes. Woo-hoo. Okay, <laughs> so exciting. Um, our theme song is by Lucia Fasano. Um, our YouTube is Citizen White Cane Podcast. Our Twitter is White Cane Pod. Um, both our Facebook and our Instagram are Citizen White Cane. If you'd like to send us an email, uh, Citizen White Cane Pod at gmail.com is our email address. Um, if you'd like to leave us a voice message, there's a link in the show notes. Do you know where Madame Ruski is? Ooh, good question. <laughs> yes. Is, is your alter ego a detective? Uh, if so, what What's, what's their name? If not, who is your alter ego? Yeah, and what um, cool, as a kid, what cool blind uh, recordings did you get of weird sounds and, and whimsical <laughs> stories? And, and um, did you ever fight with a friend and then instantly were friends again? And uh, if you, uh, what kind of weapon are you and uh, how are you dateable? Yeah, yeah, that's the most important question. Um, any of those things, there's a link in the show notes to leave us a voice message. Um, and we would we would really love to get it, even though we always make, we do make jokes about things. But you can leave us a voice message about literally anything, and we would love to hear it. And maybe we'd play it on the show if you don't want us to say in the voice message, but we would love to get voice messages either way. Um, yeah, so that and... Um, uh, subscribe to the podcast that's what you do <laughs> rate it and review it and stuff all those things and come back next week um because we're gonna have a lot of fun but it might not it's not cool it's not cool <laughs> not cool okay we'll see you then bye bye